Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fringes of the Faith, a podcast dedicated to talking about some of the strange things in the Bible and some of the obscure elements of our faith. I'm Paul Henderson, administrative pastor at Capstone Church here in Fort Worth, Texas, and sitting next to me is an awesome man of God and a great shepherd of the people. Mm. Parky Coburn, senior huh? pastor at Capstone. How are you today? I'm fine, and how sweet that is. Well, you know, if we're supposed to talk about strange things, they picked the right people to do it. So. Yes, yeah, absolutely, they yeah. did. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's just get right into it, because this, this uh, little story has always fascinated me. Um, it's this weird passage in the Old Testament, and it's really seldom talked about. And when it is talked about, it's usually... Uh, uh, talked about in one in a one dimensional sense, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so when we get to it, we'll, we'll we'll explain a little bit more about that. But this story is about Moses uh, in the wilderness with the Israelites, and you know, there's this weird thing that God commands Moses to do out there, and this is after the people have been grumbling against him and against God, um, complaining about their circumstances. Uh, so God tells Moses, He says, "I want you to to make a bronze serpent." Okay, Don't you think yeah. that's a little strange? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can remember the first time I read that s- story. I thought that was a little bit strange. Yeah. Well, here, here's one of the reasons I find it really kind of fascinating is that you know Moses. He 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 came out of Egypt. He was the adopted son of the Pharaoh. Right. right? You know the story. Yes. And so he would have been around the Egyptian religious system, and we know that they worshipped. Uh, they were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. And one of the weird things is, is one of their one of their gods of chaos. It was a a snake, mm-hmm. and it was called Epiphus, and it's the god of Ka- Egyptian god of chaos, and it was a snake. And I thought that was kind of strange. And and then I thought, well, why would God, you know, like of course God gives the the law, the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. He says, "Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images." And though here's God commanding Moses to, to make this bronze serpent, which he knew would later on become an idol for Israel. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it's strange. Um, and so when we really started digging into this little story here, um, I think God really revealed the purpose uh, of why he commanded Moses to do that. And it was for something that was planned for much, much later on down the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, thousands of years had passed, and then now we see the full plan unfolding for this particular weird occurrence in the wilderness. You want to talk about that? You ready? Yeah, yeah. All right, so... I'm still trying to... That Egyptian god, what'd you say his name was? Epiphus. Ipecac, what'd you say? Ep- Epophis. Oh, Epophis. Not Bocephus. Oh, Bocephus, yeah. yeah. Epophis. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Also, Let's also go. Also known as Apeph. Apeph. Okay. Okay. All right, I, I'm with you again. Okay. Go ahead. So let's start in Numbers 21, verses 6 through okay. 9. Okay, you right. read them? I'll read it. All right. It says this. Well, remember, uh, the people, the Israelites, were complaining against uh, no. Moses and the Lord. No, they weren't. You're, well, you're kidding me, right? They were. Okay. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord that he will remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. And then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and put it on a flagpole. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten and looks at it will live. Mm -hmm. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a flagpole, and it came about that if a serpent bit someone and they looked at the bronze serpent, they lived. Mm -hmm. Very interesting method of delivering people. It, It really is. It really is. And so... A couple of important things to think about here. Number one, the, the people in the camp were complaining against their leaders. They were complaining against Moses and complaining against God. And you know, God hears all things. And so in response, God sends these fiery serpents. So what do you think it means when, when the Bible tells us he sends fiery serpents? Well, I know that's a, uh, that's a topic of some dispute, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but I, th- I think uh, it probably refers to the color of the serpent, mm-hmm. potentially, that they were red. 
but but as I said, uh, I, there I don't think it means that fire was coming out of their mouth or uh, anything uh, like I agree. that. I yeah. Agree, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It could be fiery serpents. Could it could be, of course, the color red, like the fiery horses in mm-hmm. the story of Elijah. Yeah, it could mean that they were uh, venomous. Exactly. Could have been that when they bit people, they felt like they were on fire, burning, you know, yeah, burning. burning. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's good. Well, we know that they're obviously poisonous because we read in that passage that many people died. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, and we know that the, they were being bitten because of their complaining and their grumbling and their gossiping and their slandering. And they're really just, you know, being horrible followers of God and horrible followers of their leaders. Um, and it makes, makes you wonder, makes me wonder, did the serpents, were they only biting the ones that were guilty of sinning against the Lord, you think? Or how does that work? Do well, uh, that's a great question. I don't know if I've ever thought, thought along that angle before. I think I've always just assumed that they bit the, uh, the offenders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I've always assumed that, too. Mm-hmm. And I, to this day, that's my belief is that, why would the fiery serpents bite those that were, mm-hmm. you know, following God, following Moses uh, right. and his leadership? So in any case, the ones that were bitten, of course, well, and probably the ones that weren't because they were probably scared to death of getting bitten, they confessed their sin to Moses, and they asked him to intercede on their behalf with the hope that the Lord would remove these serpents. Mm-hmm. And so Moses meets with the Lord. The Lord tells Moses to make this bronze snake and hoist it up on a pole. But get this, God never told them to worship it. Right. He just said, look at it and right. live. Yes. He never said to do anything else with it. The instructions were very simple and very explicit. Mm-hmm. Look at it and live. Mm-hmm. Uh, not worship it, not make an idol out of it, uh, not even carry it forward after that point in time. Yeah. Just look at it. Live Did it and- have any purpose even after that point in time? None that we read about, right. except later on in, in Second Kings, but mm-hmm. that purpose was not really a good one. It wasn't one. a good one. Uh-uh. So, um, you know, it says if anyone that was bitten mm-hmm. looked at the snake, the serpent, they were healed. Um, the other thing, too, you know, God didn't say worship it. He just said look at it. But the other thing that God didn't say is, or that God didn't do is he, he didn't remove the serpents. Right. So the serpents still remained in the camp. Mm-hmm. During this time. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. That's got some, uh, I think that's got a correlation to what we'll talk about in a little bit. I think it does. Mm-hmm. And so here's, here's the thing. It says the snakes would bite, um, would bite the offender, well, the Hebrews, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm assuming they were the offenders only, but they, regardless, the serpents were biting people uh, mm. that were complaining. And here's the interesting thing. When you look at the ancient Paleo-Hebrew word for bite, the word is shin. And in ancient Hebrew pictography, it's like hieroglyphic. Hiero- mm-hmm. How do you say the word? Hieroglyphics? Hieroglyphics, yes. It's like hieroglyphics. The word shin was illustrated by drawing, by a drawing of the front two teeth, and it looks much like our W of today. Right. Okay? And they were drawn as the teeth because it, it meant to shred, to consume. Mm-hmm. All right, Mm -hmm. so this becomes important later on Mm -hmm. because this word shin is closely related to the word we use today for sin. Mm, Yes. Okay. Uh, Here's something to think about. How many Hebrews do you think were in the camp during the Exodus? Boy, that's uh, there's a lot of speculation about that, but I would say you would be conservatively safe saying hundreds of hundreds of thousands, but you could very easily, I mean, there could have easily been over a million or more. That's what most scholars say. Mm -hmm. They say that there were in between 700,000 and and a million Mm -hmm. in this camp. Um, How do you suppose that the Hebrews that were bitten, how do you suppose that they would go and find this bronze snake? Uh, Well, we don't don't have any... uh, we're not told about Moses giving them any directions about where he put it up, are we? I mean, it mm-hmm. just they did, they were just told go find it and go look, look at, at it. Yeah, go look at the snake. Right. So I, uh, I wonder would have would it have been near Moses's tent? Would it have been near the tent of meeting? Would he have put it up 
you know, in a high place. Um, where would this bronze serpent have been? Um, because regardless of where it was at, you would have to go look for it, mm -hmm. you would think. I mean, it's not going to be big enough that everybody in a 700,000 populated camp could see it all at once. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's, that's a point. One of the points that you need to be thinking about when we're talking about this is when you're talking about 700,000 to a million people camped out, that's a big camp. I mean, you know, it's they're, huge. They're, 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 it's huge. It's like, well, my goodness, it's like Fort Worth. Actually, actually it is. It's the, the estimated population of Fort Worth could be in that camp right now. Yeah. Everybody and, lives in Fort Worth could be in this camp. Yeah, and so if depending upon where you are in that camp and where the bronze serpent was, it could be quite a hike to it. A absolutely. And here's the other thing. Um, since it was made out of bronze, yeah. that would have made it very heavy. It would have been a very heavy article. Mm -hmm. um, and so it couldn't have been too big or they wouldn't have been able to lift it up on a pole. I agree with that. I doubt very seriously it was very large. Okay, and, and even if it the, the flagpole, we talked about maybe he put it in a high place. Maybe if it was even lifted really high in the air, it'd still be hard to see if you were in the back of the camp. Oh, yeah, it would be. So you wondered why I'm bringing this up, aren't you? Uh, yes. Oh, you're, you're talking to me. I am. <laughs> oh, am I on this show? Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering. Yeah. Well, because most scholars and people who have studied this topic, they always present this as it's a story about faith. You have to have faith. And when you look at the serpent that you will be healed and it's having this faith that causes the right. healing to happen. Yes. But here's something that most of them have missed in it. And yes, it is about faith. I agree with that. Uh, but I believe it is also just as equally about humility. Mm -hmm. uh, because Explain to them what you mean when you, say, when you say that. Okay. So if you're a Hebrew and you're in this camp and you are guilty of complaining against God and Moses, and right. now all of a sudden you get bit by this fiery serpent, right? Um, and we talked about the snake and where would it have been located, and it's not like you can just walk out of your tent or your booth and, and look at the snake and be healed, um, you would have to either know exactly where it is and make your way to it, or you're going to have to ask someone, where's right. the snake? Where's the snake, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if they knew, like I said, if they knew where the snake was, they would have to walk to it. They'd have to, to travel to it. And I imagine if they were bitten, um, hiding that kind of an injury would almost be impossible. I mean, if you were bitten on the leg, it's going to swell up. You ever seen a snake bite? Oh, my goodness, it swells up. No way to hide that. Well, yeah, and another thing is, uh, you know, if you've been bitten by the snake and you, you're way on the outskirts of the camp, uh, you might be moving kind of fast or as fast as possible to try to, to get to the snake. Yeah, and so I imagine that would bring some attention to you. It would bring attention to you, yes. Yeah, whether you're, you know, bleeding profusely or you're swelt up um, or you're running in, in panic toward wherever. Where's the snake? Where's the snake, Parky? Right, Where's right. the snake? Um, here's the thing. Um, think about the ones that were in the camp that weren't bitten. And they're watching this person or these people mm. running around looking for this snake. You know, if, it, if it's anything like today, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but if it's anything like today, people would be looking at them saying, ooh, look, hey, hey, look, there goes one of those, one of those gossipers. Yeah. Oh, there goes a sinner right here. Sinner right there, right there. Yes. And so I think that, you know, knowing that, okay, you got bitten, you were bitten because you were complaining, and so now you're guilty of sin. Now you're going to have to publicly go find this snake and probably ask people where it's at or, you know, running out of panic to find it. And I think that required an enormous amount of humility. Well, you're going to stand out, and people are going to see, uh, you know, as you move past the people around you. And, and that's a key. The people that were that were in their pathway, in their orbit uh, as they traveled, would have noticed that they were wounded, they were hurt, and that they were trying to find the snake. They were moving toward the snake. And they were panicked. Yes. They'd be panicked. Um, and so there is this humility. There's also this faith aspect, but they, they really work. They're, they're intertwined because not only did they have to put their pride aside, and acknowledge that they had been bitten by this, uh, the fiery serpent for, for sinning, 
they would have to uh, come out and find the snake out of humility, and then, mm-hmm. then the faith aspect would kick in. They would have to have faith that once they looked upon the snake, that they would actually be healed. Yeah, this is, there's a part of this that's a public admission. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have done wrong because there, people would have seen you. I have done wrong, and I must go to the remedy that God has provided. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, there's something really interesting when you think about this, this uh, bronze snake uh, around a flagpole, lifted up on a flagpole. Mm-hmm. We've seen this. We see this in modern, in modern day. Yeah, we see it today. Yeah, yeah, we do. We see a symbol of this, and it's actually called the rod of Asclepius, mm-hmm. if I'm saying that correctly. I have no idea. Asclepius or Asclepius. Yeah. Or it's Asclepius. Easy. Yeah, it's easy for you to say. Right. But yeah. But it's called the rod of Asclepius. And, yeah. And we see this, and if, if what we see is this symbol, this blue symbol, and really, <laughs> if you really look at it, uh, you see that the blue background, the symbol, is in the form of two crosses intersecting. Mm-hmm. Um, you see a pole. And you see this snake wrapped around the pole. What does this symbol represent today? A medicine. Medicine. It does. And so I find that interesting. Um, what does the snake have to do with the medical practice, do you think? What's the correlation there? What does the snake have to do with the medical practice? Yeah, why, why is it a snake on a pole that represents medicine? Well, because partly... Because um, they were, they looked at this snake years ago, and and it brought physical healing to them because mm-hmm. these people were physically sick, mm-hmm. and they looked at this and it brought it brought healing to them, and and there's you know uh, there's faith that operates in medicine as well. That's right. I it's mean, a, it's it, a symbol it, of healing. It, it is, and you got to have faith that the mm-hmm. things that they're going to do to you are going to work. Mm-hmm. And and you know, just like that snake on that pole, I mean, there's a lot of people that worship medicine now. Yeah, you're I mean, they don't right. look they they worship that. That's the 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 end all be all when it comes to healing and deliverance. Isn't that interesting that that we still have this connection to this bronze serpent Mm -hmm. in modern days, Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of years ago? Exactly. And it still represents healing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that just kind of let us know that the Bible really never changes? I mean, it's 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 current. It's it's as current today as it was back then. Right. It 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 does. It it does. You know, as soon as we try to purge our society, when we try to purge our society of all of these religious uh, things, you know, these religious symbols, these religious thoughts, these religious ideas, then we, the more we try to do that, the more we realize that our society and where we are and who we are as a people is very deeply rooted in these truths. Mm -hmm. And, And to remove these truths from us changes everything about us. I mean, it, it, it changes our, not only our history, but it changes uh, our, our very way uh, that we have lived, everything that we've built our faith and our belief upon. It begins to change that. It's got to reorient. I mean, you've got to create something new. Mm-hmm. And so um, it, it is. It's very, very interesting. And so all these years later, oh yeah, thousands of years later, you mm-hmm. look at the symbol uh, on ambulances or on, in medical facilities, and it's a symbol of healing. Um, remember the serpent in the Garden of Eden? Mm-hmm. I'm throwing this out there. It's kind of out of left field, but there, I think there's a connection here, too. I do, too. You know, sickness and disease is, is something that is a product of the fall, mm-hmm. the it fall is. of man. I, I'm not saying because you're sick. You, it's because you have done something specific, a sin, specifically. I'm not saying that, but our nature has been altered. Our physical nature, our, our, our entire existence has been altered by the entry of sin. Mm-hmm. And so looking at that rod of Aslepus mm-hmm. also reminds us the root of, of this 
uh, of the sickness and the disease that we face is it's a product of sin. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that it reminds us of. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when it when it reminds us of that, then that makes us look what to the cure. Yes, to the cure. And it's the dichotomy that's in this symbol. And I believe it's this dichotomy that the Lord was going to reveal to mankind or humankind later on. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you look at the uh, rod of Asclepius, you're looking at the symbol of medicine, the symbol of healing, but you're also looking at a representation of sin. You are. You are, because like you said, it all started in the garden. Um, that's when the fall occurred. And how did the fall occur? Through through the sin, snake, through yeah, the, through, the through the through the serpent, through mm -hmm. the enticements of the serpent, and that the rod of Asclepius reminds us of the snake in the tree, mm -hmm. uh, the snake in the wood, mm -hmm. uh, and and so it reminds us of that. So a, as to point to the origin, but also to point to the solution. That's right. And so here are the Hebrews. They sinned in the camp by slandering Moses and God. They were bitten. They were bitten, uh, the Hebrew word for bite is shin, mm -hmm. for their transgression. They were bitten by sin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? And in order to be healed or forgiven for their sin, they had to go find the pole. They had to look upon the serpent, meaning we already talked about they had to acknowledge their sin, and then they'd be forgiven and healed. They would live and not die due to their sin. And now we all know the wages of sin is what? It's death. We've heard that before. Yes, it's, it's in, in the, the Scripture. It's in the Scripture, right? So let's fast forward now a few thousand years. And here's this man named Jesus mm -hmm. from Nazareth. He appears on the scene, and he is stirring up the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests and the Sanhedrin, basically all of the religious leaders. Uh, he is really causing a ruckus with them, and he's teaching with authority. And that's one of the things that you see in Jesus is that when he teaches, he teaches with authority. Mm -hmm. And everyone that has heard him teach, they, they, you see this, this common theme. They say, well, who is this guy, and how does he teach with such authority? Right. And when you think about it, he's teaching with the authority of God, but also with the authority of Moses. Because there hadn't been anyone else in the history of Israel that taught with the authority of Moses, except Moses, until Jesus arrives on the scene. Mm -hmm. And it's this style of teaching that offends the spiritual leaders. And Peter affirms this very thing in Acts chapter 3. Uh, he says, uh, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like Moses, from your brothers, from your bloodline. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Moses says, like me, mm -hmm. like me. That means he'll be a deliverer. That means he'll he'll carry the words of God, the very words that that came directly from God. Mm -hmm. That he will be a leader that will lead you into the promised land. Yeah, yeah, he will he will be in the presence of God face to face, just like Moses. Yes, and there hasn't mm -hmm. been anyone right. in the history except mm -hmm. for Jesus and Moses that were able to do that. And so Peter was actually quoting Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Uh, Moses was telling the Hebrews that the Lord is going to bring someone to them from, from their own bloodline, uh, from his bloodline, who will teach with the authority of Moses. Um, so follow me here, because we're about to really kind of dig really deep. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, this is one of your favorite stories. Um, there is this meeting that occurs between Jesus. Yes, in the cover of darkness, right. with one of the members of the Sanhedrin named Nicodemus. Yes. And now Nicodemus is a Pharisee. So obviously Jesus has his attention because he talks about the resurrection. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he, obviously he's been teaching about these things, and he's got Nicodemus' attention. And so you know Nicodemus has heard about him, and I would assume that hearing all the miracles that are being performed, that Nicodemus being you know uh, uh, very high up, which means he knows the Torah, recognizes some of these prophecies that are being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I agree, too. I think Nicodemus was a little careful 
uh, I think he was trying to draw more out of Jesus. Mm-hmm. He was. I'm not saying Nicodemus knew everything about the Lord, but I think Nicodemus knew exactly what he said. We know, or I know, he said we to kind of, you know how we say we sometimes yeah. to deflect that fl- uh, the, the spotlight off of ourselves a right. little bit. But he said, I know that you're a teacher come from God. Yes, he does. He, he knew that much and believed that much, I think. Mm-hmm. And then waiting for Jesus to expound upon that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so he goes to meet Jesus, um, and this is recorded in the Gospel of John in chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Here's the interesting thing is verses 1 through 15 leads up to the famous John three sixteen. Right, that okay. does. It yes. leads right up to it. So Jesus tells Nicodemus that one must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven, which, of course, throws Nicodemus for a major loop. Mm-hmm. You want to pick the story up here. Mm-hmm. All right? I'll read it. So here's Nicodemus. This is his response. How can this be? And Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people don't accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Mm. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And here is the interesting part of this conversation that Jesus is telling Nicodemus. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Hmm. Mm. So there Jesus refers back to what God told Moses and begins to to give us the fulfillment of the correlation uh, within his own life, mm-hmm. and, and and this really helps us to understand uh, a lot a little bit more about why why Moses did what he did, mm-hmm. and why God told Moses to do what he did as well. So yeah, and so basically, what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is that the Son of Man, meaning himself, Jesus, um, is. Uh, a parallel to the serpent that was lifted up on a pole in the Hebrew mm-hmm. camp because Jesus would also be lifted up, right? his crucifixion. So Jesus is comparing what Moses commanded, uh, what, what Moses was commanded to do by God to what Jesus was commanded to do by God. He's comparing that as well. The two mm-hmm. c- commandments are, are the same. right? And here's what is really interesting. Think about it this way. When we as believers are bitten, shin, mm-hmm. by sin, where do we go to seek forgiveness? We go back uh, to the pole, mm-hmm. which we know as the cross. Mm-hmm. Uh, we go there uh, to the place where Jesus was lifted up and died. Mm-hmm. And when we're there and, and you know, uh, metaphorically, we're standing at the foot of the cross we remember two things. We remember that Jesus represents our sin. Yeah, you could not stand there and look at that. I, you know, when you let, let me back up a second. When you correlate it to the snake on the pole, you couldn't stand there and look at that and not remember I did something wrong mm-hmm. here, and that and what I see on that pole is the consequence of what I did wrong. I was bitten by that snake. Mm-hmm. Well, when you looked at Jesus on the cross, one of the things, one of the things that you couldn't help but be reminded of is I did something wrong. And and what I and what I did is the consequence for what I did is is on that pole. That's right. And so Jesus here represents the serpent. And we acknowledge our sin by, like you said, but when we look at the cross, mm-hmm. uh, we are acknowledging our sin, just like the Hebrews did when they looked on the bronze snake on the pole. So there's the first thing. We, we, right. we think about Jesus representing our sin. Here's the second thing. When we look at our cross at the pole, it's empty. Exactly. Therefore, after we've acknowledged our sin and we have sought forgiveness, We can be assured with all confidence that our sin has been removed and we are forgiven and we will live. Mm -hmm. We will be healed from the bite of sin. Exactly. You know, uh, I think it is very important to realize that when we look at the cross, 
the cross is is now empty. If the cross, you know, when you look at the snake on the pole, the snake was always on the pole. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably a deep meaning in that because the, the, the fulfillment of that was that when we look at our pole, uh, it being the cross, it's empty, mm -hmm. okay, which means there has been a fulfillment uh, of, of everything. Uh, you know, that it's, uh, we don't worship uh, that cross uh, because the 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 thing that brought us healing has left that cross. It's not on there anymore. And I do think that there is a definite correlation between the bronze snake remaining on the pole and Jesus uh, not being on the cross. I, th I think uh, so, too. Because apparently, as long as the bronze serpent remained on the pole, uh, you were going to have to keep going back to that to just keep going back every time you're bitten, every time you, you sin, you had to keep going back, you had to keep going back, keep going back. But we and know that's what the people did. That's what they did. Throughout the history. Mm -hmm. They didn't go there, look, and go away. Right. Like we do and walk in newness of life. They continued to go back and go back to that pole. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it became a sin for them. It did. Um, and the reason, you know, number two is so important for us and, and because our cross is empty is because in Catholicism, it's interesting that their cross is the crucifix, mm -hmm. and it still has Jesus nailed to it as the suffering servant. Now, I'm not criticizing Catholicism at all. I'm just pointing out something about the bronze serpent and the crucifix that seem to be related to one another, and I think it's crucial to understanding some of the differences between Roman Catholicism and Protestants, mm -hmm. because... And let me just be honest with you, it's no secret that the Roman Catholic Church venerates the disciples and the apostles and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, it's no secret that they pray to Mary and to angels like Gabriel and Raphael. Uh, they have statues of the, the apostles and the saints in their uh, cathedrals that mm -hmm. they say prayers to. They have golden images, um, including Mary, and, and they include Mary in their worship. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. uh, Church. I'm, I know there's evangelical Catholicism. And, yes. You know, they're, they're, they have different views. But it's this crucifix um, that seems to be a focal point, um, one of the main focal points. And so let's, let's hearken back to the serpent on the pole for a second. And let's look at this. Yeah, so we have to be very careful that the pictures and the types don't become the reality. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and I, that, I think that's what you're talking about mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You know, and to see Jesus on the cross doesn't tell the full story. That's right. It's, it's not a complete story. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, that's okay. So when we, when we look about, okay, how is this crucifix related to, uh, specifically related to the bronze serpent on the pole? Let's look at what happened to the bronze serpent long after the death of Moses and long after Joshua and, and even after King David came. Right. And in order to do that, we need to look at 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. And I'm going to read it, okay? You ready? Okay, I'm ready. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abiyah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones and statues, mm -hmm. and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Mm. 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 Yes, yeah, so they were continuing to go back and go back and go back to seek some kind of favor to worship this thing. They were burning incense to it. Yeah, which, all throughout the years. Which is a form of worship. Mm -hmm. So Nehushtan in Hebrew is actually a derogatory term. It's like a name that, mm -hmm. you, that you're calling. It. And really what it means is the great serpent. But the way it's used, it's like this. 
oh, the great serpent, mm -hmm. very sarcastically. Right. Oh, you're going to go burn incense to the great serpent. Mm -hmm. And so it became a derogatory term describing the bronze serpent. This is closely related to the crucifix being worshipped as an idol. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we need to be careful of is elevating the cross itself to the status of an idol. Mm -hmm. We don't want to make the cross an ahushtan mm -hmm. uh, because we don't worship the cross. We worship the one who died on the cross yes. for our sin. Yes, and he's no longer on the cross. Now, now we understand that the cross can be a beautiful reminder of the full work of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But as you said, it's not an item of worship. Mm -hmm. it, it, we don't, it, it doesn't tell the complete story. It tells a part of the story, but not the complete story mm -hmm. of the Lord. Just like that bronze serpent, the bronze serpent only played a part in the walk that these people, people had with God, in their lives with God. It wasn't the fullness of everything. It, it, it played a role. It, mm -hmm. it, was, it played a role in their healing, but it wasn't the full story because their God was alive. Their God was in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. He was there. The one that they were to follow, to worship, to look to was right there in the middle. There was no reason to settle for a part when they had the whole mm -hmm. of the presence of God right there in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jesus is no longer on the cross for mm -hmm. us. He's, he's resurrected. And I'm not criticizing anyone who has a crucifix or Catholicism. It's always good to be reminded, like you said, of Christ suffering for our sin. Um, I'm just really thankful that after he suffered and died for our sin, that he was raised to life again in order for us to be forgiven of our sins, yes. in order for us to be healed from the bite of sin and to inherit eternal life. So when I look at the cross... Uh, the empty cross, it reminds me of eternal life. It reminds me of my sin, but it also reminds me, hey, I'm forgiven, and I now have inherited eternal life. You know what it reminds me of, too, Pastor Paul? It, it doesn't... It, it reminds me of, of the sin and how I have been forgiven. But when the cross is empty, then it reminds me that the Lord has not just paid for my sin and healed and delivered me, but he has provided a way for me in the now to walk in, in newness of life. Mm, you know, and that's where I am now. Yes. That's where I am right now is in that period of time where I, the Lord is tabernacled with me, just like he was with those Israelites back mm -hmm. then. And he has tabernacled with me, and, and he is living in me now. And I don't, uh, I need to live in that reality. I don't need to, uh, to go back continually and look at the, the suffering of the cross. I'm thankful for that. But that's not where I am. Once, once I have gone through that process of my sin being paid for and me being delivered from it, then I get my eyes on the tabernacle. Mm. That's where God is now. Mm. He's tabernacled in the midst of us. Amen. And so Jesus doesn't say um, that everyone who looks upon him as, a, as the serpent on the pole will have eternal life. He doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He says that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Because if yes. you remember, um, he says, Jesus himself says, he was lifted up. He must be lifted up mm -hmm. so that everyone who believes has eternal life. Not everyone who looks upon it, which is a little different from the Israelites having to just look upon the bronze serpent and be healed. We have to go a little bit farther than that. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have to believe. We have to believe. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to believe, which is evidenced in, 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 through our walk. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, They were not to come back there, stay there, and, and burn incense. They were to look at that, receive what that what that had for them, and then they were to walk on in the presence of God, hmm. and 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 you know, and I think there is a parallel in that as to what the the mistake that the children of Israel did in continuing to worship the serpent on the pole and us, you know, that that we don't worship that cross, we don't worship uh, that symbol, and we don't. We, we look at that, we realize a powerful work happened there. But then we move from there on 
into what God has for us to live in in the now. Mm-hmm. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's good. So we talked about the wages of sin or death. And now let's talk about the reward for faith is eternal life. Oh, yeah. I like it when you talk like that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So Nehushtan is a term for an idol. It's a derogatory. And in Hezekiah's day, it was was a name. It's like you call, when you say Nehushtan, it's like you're calling a name. You're calling somebody Mm -hmm. a name. Right, it was derogatory. Yeah. Today, did you know that we can use the term Nehushtan to describe some of the things in our faith that have become idols? Now, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you know, our conversation is, is moving a little bit into stepping on some toes. Now, you know, if we're not careful, we can make a liturgy out of our worship. And, and what I mean by that is the, 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 the uh, type becomes the substance. Mm-hmm. The type becomes the substance. And we have to be careful that we don't do that in our worship with the Lord. And, and you know, we've talked about this on previous podcasts about uh, the crisis in the church and some of these other things that we're about to talk about. Um, and so this is just something to be looking out for, to really kind of searching your heart and your motives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is not to, um, you know, beat people over the head or, you know, there, there's... No condemnation here. Sure. But this is something that is, is truthful, and it's something we need to be aware of. So we can use the term Nehushtan today to describe things in our faith like the worship itself. The worship experience itself can be a Nehushtan. The feeling of elation when we're singing praises to God, we begin seeking the feeling more than focusing on who we are worshiping. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I do. Uh, You know, we can, and and there's nothing wrong in and of itself with what you feel when you worship. But we're called not to worship because we feel. We're called to worship because of who God is. Mm -hmm. And so a Nehushtan can also be works. Oh, yeah. When we, uh, when what we do for the kingdom becomes more important than the king. Mm Mm-hmm. And we all know that works without faith is dead. Faith is demonstrated by works, but when those works become your identity instead of your identity in Christ, mm-hmm. yes. now you're crossing over into this area of you know, making your works an idol. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we always need to remember that salvation is a gift so that no one can boast. And if we begin to boast in our works, then our works become a Nehushtan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm. Nehushtan can be the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, wait a minute now. Mm -hmm. When we start seeking the physical evidence of God through signs and wonders instead of seeking God's face. They, you know, I believe, and I'm going to say this real quickly, but I believe one of the things that God's doing in the church right now, uh, especially in the charismatic movement, is he, he's working Nehushtan out of us. Yes, he is. Uh, he's growing us up and getting us back to the very reason that we, uh, we worship the Lord, mm-hmm. and that is because we, he loves us and we have a relationship for him and because of who he is. Uh, rather than uh, worshiping for the f- worshiping for the signs and the wonders, right. the things that are a part of the kingdom of God, but only a part. Mm-hmm. And and so we see this from time to time. We see people who follow the signs and the wonders from church to church, which is like what Jesus said to Nicodemus. That's like chasing the wind because mm-hmm. you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. Only the Lord knows. And so if you're constantly chasing the works, and I mean, not the works, but the signs and the wonders, uh, you're going to be doing a lot of running. You know, and I heard somebody say, well, you know, faith uh, faith produces signs and wonders. I agree, but you know what? The faith is the foundation of everything in, in our walk with God. Mm-hmm. Everything, mm-hmm. everything. And faith is also required to believe God when, uh, when we don't see anything happening. That's in right. the natural, that's right. But we still believe. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's faith. Yeah, that's true faith. Mm-hmm. When there's nothing happening around you and you continue to believe, mm-hmm. that's faith. Uh, Nehushtan can be the number of the crowds. Mm-hmm. 
when we focus more on following what the crowd is doing and we start using numbers to determine whether God is moving, uh, then the numbers become the Nehushtan. Mm-hmm. We're looking for numbers and we're worshiping exactly uh, in places where there are numbers. I mean, uh, it's, it's not uh, a very good thing. It's not a very good, uh, what am I trying to say here? It's not a very good factor to focus on. No, you you can get big numbers at a my my first pastor you say you can get a big crowd at a dog fight. Now, numbers can be a sign that God is doing something there, uh, but numbers don't ne- are not necessarily a sign that anybody's being transformed or changed. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know it could be. Uh, but it could not be. You know, Jesus had big numbers around him when he did that hard teaching about the fle- the body and the blood, the f- my fle- eat my flesh and drink my blood. Mm-hmm. Had big numbers around him, but he knew those people weren't being transformed. And when he got into, uh, you know, the, f- the depth of the relationship and the lordship of Jesus that must take place in their life, you know, the, the numbers scattered. Mm-hmm. And Nehushtan can be as simple as our own preferences and our desires. When we focus on what we want out of a ministry, rather than focus on what God wants or what he's doing, mm-hmm. um, then our own desires and our own preferences become a Nehushtan. Mm-hmm. For sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then finally, Nehushtan can be a position. When we seek out authority and place importance on titles, roles, and positions within the church, rather than just carrying out the will of God in our personal lives, then we're focused in the wrong area, and we're essentially burning incense to this Nehushtan Mm -hmm. uh, that's operating. So I really believe, like as you said, that there is a spirit of Nehushtan that's operating and that the Lord is revealing that to his church. And, you know... Hopefully, uh, we'll begin to start reassessing our, our hearts and doing some uh, hard inventory and, and really asking some hard questions to ourselves. And if any of these things are coming out, then it's as simple as going back to the cross, mm-hmm. and repenting from your sin. And, it is, yes. Mm-hmm. Praise God for that. You know, I've gotten off in these areas in my life mm-hmm. and started looking to something else to be the validation that God is with me rather than the Word of God and rather than what the Lord says. Mm-hmm. I started looking at signs, you know, uh, rather than just, hey, the Lord's saying, I'm with you, son. Have you really, if you've really repented of your sins and accepted me as being Lord and Savior, I am here. I am here, and I am here to guide you, and I'm here to lead you, and I will take you where I want you to go. Uh, follow me, and I will make you to become that which you're not right now. I'll make you to become a fisher of man, but I do the transforming. And, and I've made the mistake of looking around uh, at other things before to, to validate the fact that God is present rather than just very simply the word of the Lord. And, and I think that's what God is doing in, in in us in a large capacity right now in the church and and the charismatic church too. Mm-hmm. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, Nehushtan, the serpent, and the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, and like we talked about in the very beginning, God had a plan and a purpose for what He commanded Moses to do when He said. Make a bronze serpent and lift it up on a pole. That bronze serpent represents your sin. And when you acknowledge your sin and you look upon it and you have faith, then you'll be healed. Do we have time for me to say one more thing? We have all the time. There's a New Testament parallel to this serpent on the pole and worshiping it. And that's when Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And they got up there and a great thing happened in front of them. Uh, An amazing thing. Moses... uh, uh, showed up. Elijah showed up. Jesus was glorified in front of them. Peter said, it's a good thing for us to be here. And I say amen to that. That was a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But then the next thing, Peter says, let's start raising up a tabernacle to this, to what has happened here. Mm -hmm. And, And we have to be careful and remember that we are not to 
worship patterns, even things the way God has done things before, because he may do things completely different in the future. He may do things in a different way. So we can't, you know, worship that, oh, God healed us, uh, you know, the mo- people in Moses' day. God healed us by looking at this serpent. And so that's the formula and the way he's going to do everything from now on. So we need, to, we need to stick with that. We need to stick with that. And, uh, you know, Peter and, and was kind of following that same line of thinking in the New Testament. And the father spoke. And, and he said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Do what he says and don't make an idol out of anything that he has done. Follow him. And, and so I think that's what God is saying because, you know, we, we have used so many things. We, we have said, Lord, if you're going to move, it's going to happen this way. We know it's going to happen this way because that's the way you did it in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we better get ready for Jesus walking on the water. Uh, and what flipped the disciples out so bad about that was he came to them in a new way. Mm-hmm. They had never seen him come to them that way before. They didn't recognize that. As a matter of fact, at first they misinterpreted it and thought he was a ghost. They were terrified at first. I think we better get ready for those type of moves. Mm. Amen. Well, that's it for now. Uh, we so appreciate y'all for, for watching and for listening. And remember, if you have any comments, uh, just enter them in the section below if you're watching on YouTube. Um, if you have any suggestions uh, for episodes, shoot us an email at info at capstone.church. Well, I want to thank you, Pastor Parkey. This was an interesting topic. Um, yeah, it was fun. Thank you, Pastor Paul. We really got, we really got in, the, in the weeds on this one, and I loved it. It was great. Well, we did, uh, but if we ever want to be able to, to get through out of the weeds, then uh, we need to first admit we're in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> so, But well, we got in the weeds, and hopefully we got out. <laughs> yeah. Well, God bless you guys. We love you, and remember, stay in the Word, stay alert, and be not deceived. God bless you. God bless you.